Okay, I didn't see how many people put up their hands, but uh, I want everyone with a smartphone to turn it on and get the screen going and have it face me. Quick, we don't have much time. Oh, look at that. And I want you to go this way and that way. And that's how a rock star feels. <laughs> cool. Well, um, thanks very much for having me, and uh, awesome turnout today, and I'm really excited to talk to you about a little bit more uh, serious topic, and that is how to apply technology to truly impact society. It's been my honor to have that ability in my career in a couple of different ways. First, I'd like to introduce you to a friend of mine named Cy Peterson. When Cy was 14, uh, did a cherry drop in gymnastics, landed on his head, broke his spinal cord in three different places, and became a C C1 quadriplegic. And I got to know Cy after that, and when I was in undergrad electrical engineering, did a project that helped him communicate. He uh, couldn't speak, uh, he couldn't move his head, all he could do was touch a switch with his lip. And we had to take that challenge and say, how can we turn that input into control of a computer. And the long and short of it is we did. He was able to touch his lip. We basically made a laptop for his wheelchair in 1987 before laptops existed. And it helped him communicate. It helped change his life. And it helped change my life. It was just a student project and a kind of crazy one at that because it went way beyond what the class was supposed to be. We found ourselves in a grad lab working on this thing into the next semester while all of my fellow students were saying, are you nuts? We have final exams to do. But I, I knew that I you know, had found what I wanted to do. And Sai changed my life with one question. Up until this time, it had just been a student project. And for 20 years, Sai laid in bed and changed people's lives. He was an amazing guy. He wrote a book. Um, he's passed away since, but one simple question changed my life. After he tried our stuff, he said, who, who are you going to help next? And with that question, I knew my career was set. And I helped Cy, and with that question, he's helped a lot of other people, because it spurred me on to help many people with disabilities. I got to hang out with Christopher Reeve and Muhammad Ali because both of them had a disability that made it so they couldn't use their hands. But besides them, there were thousands of others, like Bill Miller, who's a local artist. Bill was a school teacher, got MS. He's an artist. He thought he lost his ability to draw. And we built a head tracking system that he could move his head and through a computer continue doing his art. So we had to take a really difficult problem. How do you allow someone to control a computer if they can't use their hands. And with a little innovative thinking, we managed to do that for thousands of people, either through head tracking or switching. Uh, there's many people out there now that can use the computer as an enabling tool for an education, for a job, for socialization. The computer helps level the playing field for these people with disabilities. Along the way, we made an on-screen keyboard and it was originally intended for to help people with disabilities, and it turned out it helped a lot of people who suddenly found themselves using devices that didn't have a regular keyboard. Smartphones, where somehow you have to enter text. So we invented Swipe, where you just slide your finger from letter to letter, and it's a, it's a much quicker way than tapping on each letter. Uh, to date, I think it's over 200 million uh, copies of Swipe is installed. And our goal is to be able to say there's over a billion. Originally invented for people with disabilities, turned into a mainstream product. We sold the company last year. So I had to move on and say, OK, what am I going to do next? There's only one thing better than changing people's lives, I figured, and that may be saving people's lives. So I took a look at the top causes of death in Canada. Number one, cancer. Number two, heart disease. Number three, strokes. No big surprise, those are the big three. But what's number four? Think about it. What could be number four? Balls. Texting while driving. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
Maybe in five years we're going to get there. Um, notice you just can't swipe with, without looking, so don't do that while driving. Well, it turns out the number four cause of death in Canada is going to the hospital. Now, I don't mean you go to the hospital with some chronic disease that kills you. I mean you go to the hospital for one thing, and you catch an infection while you're in the hospital as a result of being there, and that infection kills you. It's called hospital-acquired infections. And the statistics are just under 100,000 people a year in the United States, and you tack on about 10% for Canada, so it's well over 100,000 people a year die from this hospital-acquired infection. 1.7 million people catch an infection, so it's about a 1 in 17 chance that they're going to pass away while they catch it. We actually are much worse in North America than other parts of the world. 11.6% uh, of people going in hospitals catch infections in Canada. Compare that to about 7% in Europe. Why the difference? One of my colleagues in Europe put it this way, that's what a few good plagues will do for you. <laughs> you know, a third of the population in Europe has been wiped out through plagues, and so they're very focused on infection control. Well, what does 100,000 deaths a year look like? That sounds like a lot, it's hard to get the perspective. Well, the single most destructive man-made event in history was the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. 60,000 people died instantly, and about another 60,000 died as a result of the after effects. It's about 120,000 people. We, we kill about that many every year in our hospitals. To put it in perspective a little further, this year's Super Bowl almost broke the record with 103,219 people in attendance. So that's about 100,000 people. So imagine that terrorists came into the Super Bowl stadium and blew everyone up, and 103,000 people died. They did that to the World Trade Center, and we've been at war for 12 years now as a result. Well, this happens every year. It's not just once, it's every year, every Super Bowl is getting blown up. Here's the enemy that's doing it. It's not terrorists, it's bacteria. This is the new enemy, and make no mistake, we're under attack. And we need to take note of it. How do we create these superbugs? Well, it's ironic, but we create them by killing them. There's disinfectant that kills 99.9% .9 of all germs. The problem is that 0.1% that it didn't kill are the really strong ones. And I managed to get a picture of these. Here's what these superbugs look like. These are the Arnold Schwarzenegger of bugs. And we just wiped out, wiped out all their competition. So they're left to flourish. So it's actually our doing that's creating these superbugs. Uh, Overprescription of antibiotics and overuse of disinfectant have made hospitals a breeding ground for these superbugs. Last year's movie put out by Warner Brothers Contagion, you know, scares us all about a worldwide epidemic from some new type of uh, bacteria that couldn't be killed, it's not that far from what could really happen. Just to bring it uh, back to our real world, uh, a friend of mine, Gil Allen, uh, talked to me a couple weeks ago about his dad who um, had routine pacemaker surgery, uh, went into the hospital, this is three months ago, right here in Edmonton, and died from an infection that he caught, C. difficile, while in the hospital. So I'm going to let Gil tell you the rest of the story in his own words. By February uh, 5th, he was in, in remarkably good condition, um, given all that he'd been through. And in fact, that day, I had taken him uh, to the food court in the hospital. We got ice cream. He was kibitzing with other patients and uh, um, you know, flirting with nurses and just generally uh, cutting up. We. Um, had been discussing at length all of his plans to return home. It was definitely his agenda to return home. He had a lot to, to look forward to, uh, plans with his grandchildren and so on. He still had good quality of life. Uh, he had a lot to look forward to. 
you know, um, his grandchildren, you know, are, have been really shortchanged by it. And I will go to my grave always believing that it ended by following the right protocols. On, uh, on February 5th, as I say, he was, he was my dad. He was completely himself. Four days later, he was dead. So that kind of makes it real, doesn't it? I would guess that there's people in this room who have had this touch their lives. That many people are affected by it. In fact, in the time I've spent talking, three people have passed away from hospital-acquired infections in North America. So what can we do about it? Well, I'm an electrical engineer. I'm not a doctor. I'm not an immunologist. I'm not even a biology guy. I took physics. So how can I possibly help in this war against superbugs? Well, it turns out there are some things that I could do. One of the biggest causes is hand washing. This is a news article in the Edmonton Journal two days ago where they held a press conference explaining that uh, someone who had died in a hospital here in town was from an infection that someone brought from India and they could not kill it. And they attributed inadequate hand washing to one of the causes of death. And I want to point out that this is a huge step forward for Alberta Health Services to admit that this is the problem. That's, that's the first step, is identifying a problem that we can help solve. Uh, healthcare workers are extremely busy and extremely dedicated to helping people. So it's not just, you know, non-interest in, in uh, the problem. They're just so busy that it, sometimes it's easy to forget to wash their hands. There's a um, statistic that shows hand washing compliance across the board, no matter what hospital it is, is at about 40%. And if somebody's monitoring it, it's at about 90%. So it's just a reminder. Somebody knows, somebody's watching, oh yeah, I need to wash my hands. So washing hands is a really big deal. Turns out there's another study that shows commonly touched surfaces. So these are things that our hands touch. And you know, water faucet handles, doorknobs, the uh, trolley poles, ventilators, those all get wiped regularly. But the, the most contaminated surface in the hospital are computer keyboards, found out. So I want to quickly demonstrate to you how this might happen. I'm going to get my lovely daughter Ariana to give me a hand. So I'm going to be a doctor. And so I'm over here fixing a, a, a wound on a patient, and I'm going to forget to wash my hands, and then I'm going to come in and type on my keyboard. The next person, and she just washed her hands, so she thinks her hands are clean. She's logged in on the computer, and now she's going to go and treat the next patient. So let's see what our hands look like as a result. It's my trusty black light. So here are the germs that I spread to the keyboard. Here's what the keyboard looks like as a result. And let's see what Dr. Ariana's hands look like after she thought she had washed them. So she thinks her hands are clean, and now she's going to go treat the next patient. It's that easy to transfer infection from patient to staff to staff to patient. So keyboards are a big problem. Hey, keyboards, that's something I know a little bit about. An electrical engineer can relate to that. I've been spending most of my career doing keyboard stuff. So we thought, well, how could we help solve that problem? You know, that graph tells us keyboards are causing a lot of the, the problem. So we invented something called Clean Keys. And it replaces this problem. This is an actual keyboard in a hospital. They put rubber covers over it, so the idea is you can wipe it, so they had the right idea. The problem is nobody did it. And this rubber cover is actually capturing dirt. This is on a trolley system that actually gets wheeled into the OR, you know, where the doctor comes in like this because he's just scrubbed, and then logs in on this keyboard. <laughs> Scary. I mean, this actually happens. And if you asked 
hospital staff, whose job is it to clean that keyboard? Nobody really knows. Is it housekeeping? Is it the staff? And you can see the rubber on the keyboard actually is making the problem worse. So we invented Clean Keys, which is a completely flat glass surface keyboard. You know, how do you make a keyboard with no keys? Well, the keys are the problem, all those little gaps and you can't wipe in there. So we challenged ourselves to say, let's make a keyboard with no keys. So we made a touch sensitive surface, but you have to be able to rest your fingers on it. So that gave the guys the challenge, okay, we're gonna make a touch keyboard, but you gotta, you gotta let the user rest their fingers. They say, okay, you want a touch surface that doesn't do anything when people touch it. <laughs> Think out of the box, guys. So they did, and they came up with uh, vibration and touch sensors. So now you can rest your fingers, and when you tap on the keyboard, it senses that vibration and allows you to type. So a little out-of-the-box thinking, and now we have a perfectly wipeable keyboard. It's only half the battle. Remember that chart about hand washing? So we made a keyboard that's easy to clean, but what's missing? Monitoring. So we said, oh, okay, we've got sensors in this thing. We can tell when somebody's typing. What if we could tell if somebody's wiping? So we built in something called automated surveillance. So we use those same touch sensors to detect a wiping motion. And in case you try to fool it by just wiping your hand over it, we also take a look at the capacitance after you've wiped it, which should be different because there's liquid on it. And the rate that that liquid evaporates tells us if you just use water or if you use an alcohol-based cleaner. So we can tell if you've really cleaned this keyboard or not. It doesn't take a human standing there with a clipboard. They can actually detect and, and monitor the cleaning of the keyboard by itself. This is a technology at work, I'm not a doctor. I'm not trying to fight the bugs and kill them. That's somebody else's job. But I can use technology to help. This isn't just, let's spend billions of dollars to save lives. Turns out, these infections are costing our healthcare system billions of dollars. Uh, this is CDC's estimate uh, eight years ago that it's $35 billion. There's a study just came out uh, last year that upped that number to $45 billion. So you spend a little money on prevention, saves a lot of money at the cure side. So this is a win-win. We save lives and we save money. So these are examples of things that I get to work on and have, have really enjoyed my career doing it. Along the way, Swipe popped out. And I'm really happy about Swipe. We sold the company for lots of money last year, and that lets me do other things. But let's face it, making a faster way of texting isn't really going to change the world. You know, my teenage daughter is really happy she can text more. <laughs> and thank goodness for unlimited texting plans. But it's not really changing the world. Let's, you know, let's be honest. But think if we put all the same energy, passion, money, attention, into really looking at the hard problems in our society, rather than what's the next big Facebook. A lot of what Daryl was saying could happen. These big companies and little companies, just putting a little attention, can have a little creative thinking, and it can help solve really big problems. So I'm gonna pass along size motivation to me and challenge each one of you to go home today and think, who are you going to help next? Thank you very much. <laughs>